Okay. Here we go. Greetings, everyone. I'm Rose of Walk in the Woods, a mm, holistic gathering space, for lack of better phrasing in the moment, rooted in sunny Winstead, Connecticut. And I'm coming to you today from my, from my little hut, as I call it, on uh, my treasured little acre of Mohegan land that I call home. And I welcome you to Knowing Neighbors. If it's your first time here, this is an online community gathering that happens every two weeks on alternating Thursdays at 6 p.m. for those of you that are here. Um, that's obvious. And I'm gonna ask one more time if everyone would please keep themselves muted. I'd really appreciate it. Um, but this is a place where we gather to get to know one another. We get to get to come together to learn who our regional neighbors are, get to know what some of their skills and experiences are, some of the resources that they have to share with us, and quite possibly realize and recognize for ourselves the skills and resources that we actually possess that we might not be aware of. So that's what knowing neighbors is, at least in part. It's a place too where we can be inspired to learn new things and renew existing skills. Uh, a place that encourages us to reach out to our neighbors and to be a neighbor in the spirit of mutual aid. A place where we might be able to support one another in meaningful and valuable ways outside of the conventional structures. So before I start, or before I introduce today's co-host, um, our format is um, our guest, our, our co-host, Belitha, will do her presentation, and then it will be followed by a question and answer period. And I want to encourage you, any questions you have throughout the presentation, please just pop them in the chat. And when we get to that section, um, I'll relay your questions to Belitha. And with that, in respect to, to the format, um, I have to offer gratitude to Soul Fire Farms, Ask Assist the Farmer, uh, weekly Zoom gather for this format. format. And I will, um, let me snag that right now. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Soul Fire Farm or Ask Assist a um, Farmer, it happens Fridays at 4 p.m. I'll post the links and the information about that um, in our chat. So let me see. I I think that's it for me. So I'm going to turn it over to Felita for her to introduce herself and uh, we'll take it from there. Felita. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Felita Stemplis Cowdery, and I am, I guess you could say, co founder of Cottage of the Three Cats. Um, I would like to first thank Rose for including me in this Knowing Neighbors segment. Uh, it is an honor to share with you a little bit about the cottage. And um, so I'm going to start a screen share. So please bear with me as technology is not my strong suit. Um, let's see here. All right. Okay. Here we go. So what is Cottage of the Three Cats? Um, so put simply, we're an apiary, gardens, um, and folk art, but we're truly much more and always are ever expanding. Uh, we are passionate about establishing a self-sustainable homestead in hopes of uh, creating a tradition uh, that will be passed on from generation and generation. Um, and to teach anyone that who would like to learn from us. Uh, basically, we want to be able to live on our own without relying on big box stores or um, things of that nature. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a background. Uh, we live on the land that I grew up on in Granby, Connecticut, um, in the house that my grandfather and my father built um, when they immigrated here from Lithuania. Uh, we want to honor how they originally worked the land and provided for themselves. So our goal is to live off the land while making a living from the land. Um, 
So we have also done some research and discovered that the land we live on was originally um, that of the Tungsus Nation. Um, so who are we? Um, we are myself and my husband, Ron, and he'll be probably joining us for the question and answer session um, for any more of the difficult B questions that I can't field. Um, he's more of the, the scientific guy in this all. <laughs> um, so we, had, we started the dream of the cottage um, the day after our wedding in 2015 when we picked up three pounds of raw, unprocessed um, beeswax from a local beekeeper. Um, we wanted to start making our own bombs and our own salves for just personal use. Um, so at the time we were living in Northampton, Massachusetts. And if you know anything about Northampton or the area at all, there are tons of farm to table and all natural and do it yourself type thing. So coupled with our already curious mindset and wanting to create and do things from step one or from scratch, uh, we looked up a local beekeeping um, class uh, and, took, and that winter we took an intro to beekeeping course. Um, we went through the Hamden County Beekeepers Association. Um, so most states and counties have beekeeping clubs or associations um, that you can look up and take classes. Um, we at the cottage, we also offer an intro to beekeeping course that we hope to be holding again in the late winter, early spring, um, or uh, if we need to come up with a virtual alternative. Uh, so we highly recommend uh, getting as much knowledge on beekeeping before getting your first hive. Uh, we are five years into it and we still have so many questions or uh, what we call our bee mentors. Um, but also with the experience we've gained over the past five years, we are mentors to several beginner beekeepers. And that's one of the great thing about the beekeeping community is that if one of us has an issue with a hive or something happens that we've never seen before, uh, we just give our mentors a call and you know we either send them a picture or they come over and um, we just help each other with uh, our bees. And beekeepers just constantly geek out about bees. So <laughs> we like uh, spending time with each other and um, each other's hives especially. Um, so I'll get back to bee basics in a little bit, but I just wanna glance over all the other parts of the homesteading um, and folk art that we do here at the cottage. Um, so the gardens part, um, that's threefold. So we believe in the healing power of nature and um, the healing power of what Mother Gaia has provided us all with. Um, and we seek herbal remedies for our ailments. So other than a few prescribed prescriptions, I personally have not touched an OTC med pretty much since uh, 2014. Um, at first we were buying many of our herbs from Acadia Herbals in Northampton, which sadly closed in November of 2019. But in 2016, we started growing many of our own herbs. And every year since then, uh, we constantly add to the list of things to plant. Um, and thankfully, on a whim, we went to the uh, open house at Whiting Mills, and we met Rose and her, her little shop of Walk in the Woods, and Raven's Edge also upstairs. Um, so whatever we don't plant, we supplement from them. And then we also get a lot from Artemisia Botanicals over in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, we try not to order anything offline um, because we always want to support the local small businesses um, in the area. Um, so secondly, um, we have the gardens to provide some of our food. Um, 
to have fresh, garden to table, and also to put by for winter. Um, so growing up in Granby and then living in Western Mass for a period of time, I was always spoiled with having farm stands and farmers markets and just farms everywhere. Um, so I've always been a huge locavore. I love knowing where my food comes from and supporting those who make it and grow it or raise it. <laughs> So when we moved back to the Granby area and having the available land, uh, we started expanding not only the herb beds, but also uh, the vegetable gardens and the uh, berry patches. Um, we also took care of the existing vegetation. Uh, Ron revitalized my grandmother's current bushes and ma has made cuttings from them. And um, so the original plants and the cuttings are super happy and thriving. Um, so I always say that my grandmother is helping and happy <laughs> with the gardens. Um, so thirdly, we um, plant a patch of rye each year. So not only um, does the, the rye provide us with green berries that we use for milling our own flour, um, but we primarily plant the rye for uh, my Lithuanian folk art, um, which brings us to that portion of the cottage. Um, since I was little, uh, my cultural heritage has always been important to me, both the Filipino side and the Lithuanian side. And I was lucky to grow up with my paternal grandparents. Um, they taught me Lithuanian, um, the language since I was born, and we were lucky that Connecticut had a big, has a has a big strong Lithuanian community um, where I attended Saturday school. Um, this is where children of Lithuanian heritage spend their Saturday mornings learning um, the language, the history, the customs, and my favorite was the uh, the folk art. Uh, my brother and I also attended. A Lithuanian culture camp in Brattleboro, Vermont called Nettinga um, and we're still involved with that camp today. He is part of the, the board and I myself teach some folk art classes there um, during the summer. Uh, I'm lucky to know a uh, Lithuanian master folk artist Aldona Simon and Kiana who is a dear friend of, of mine and the family's. Um, and she had unofficially taken me under her wing to learn all the crafts and um, just pass on her um, knowledge of the folk tradition. Um, so in 2018, um, Alda and I actually received a grant from the Connecticut Cultural Heritage Arts Program, um, which is run through the Connecticut Historical Society um, to continue our work together officially as mentor and um, mentee. Uh, so that program is actually officially called the Southern New England uh, Apprenticeship Program. And I, they are currently accepting mentor and ex uh, apprentice applications now. And basically it's um, about cultural uh, passing on cultural ways and traditions. Um, so you can, if you're anyone's interested, uh, just navigate to the chs.org website and it's under the CCHAP tab. Um, so I'm constantly learning from this wonderful artist and adding to my skills as, as an artist myself. And with learning the different arts and delving deeper and deeper into homesteading, um, it leads me down many, many rabbit holes. <laughs> and as I said before, we're constantly learning and constantly expanding. Um, and with COVID and the quarantine, it has completely put us in like full speed ahead. Um, uh, during this last three months, I've learned numerous new skills. Um, I've learned to sew, and together with my uh, mom, uh, we've donated over 200 masks to um, essential workers. And now, due to popular demand, I've been, um, I created a website and I'm uh, now selling what I create. Uh, I also have been teaching myself to solder silver. Um, if anyone 
out there knows me, I'm a big ring fanatic. Um, so I decided, hey, why not put add another thing to my list? Um, so I'll actually be starting to put out pieces next week that I'm I'm happy enough to, to share. <laughs> um, and if homesteading and art and bees weren't enough, I also recently was certified, uh, got my Reiki 2 certification. So that's the other side <laughs> of the cottage. Um, but let's get back to the curls. Um, so we're back to Beak Basics and I'll be doing a quick overview of some frequently asked questions that we hear um, on a regular basics. So um, the first thing that usually people ask is who lives in the hive? Uh, so there are three, three, that three honeybees that are in the hive. There are worker bees, the one queen bee, and then drones. So I'm just gonna take a sip of water. <laughs> So the queen bee, there's only one queen per hive. Um, her job is to lay fertilized eggs. She lays about 1,200 eggs a day and she lives um, only three to four years. Uh, so that's what she does from the minute she um, takes her mating flight. She um, only has to mate once and this gal right here with the red dot on her, um, that is the queen. You can tell that she is longer and skinnier than these worker bees. Um, and the reason why this queen has a red dot, uh, some, some beekeepers who raise queens in order to make it easier for uh, other keepers to find the queens, they um, offer marked queens. We usually do unmarked queens ourselves, but this picture um, shows a marked queen. Uh, so uh, next we have the workers. And what do the workers do? The workers do pretty much everything. From the time they're born, they start working. Um, they live during, you know, during the spring and summer, they live about six weeks. Um, and then once things start, slowing down, they can um, live up to four months to overwinter. Uh, as soon as they're born, they start housekeeping. They clean out their own cell and um, just, you know, just gets straight put to work. Um, after, so they take um, different stages as their life progresses over the six weeks. So after their housekeeping bee, they turn into a nurse bee where they um, take care of the larva, take care of the eggs, they feed, feed the eggs, and um, also uh, they, they feed and um, take care and clean the queen and the, uh, the drones as well. Uh, they also produce wax, and in the couple slides there, I'll show you a picture of their wax glands. Um, they also do undertaker work and guard bees. So obviously there will be some death in the hive. So they will pick up those, those bees that have passed and take them out of the hive. And usually they'll um, fly a couple feet away from the hive um, to take out those bees just in case they, there's something wrong with the, um, with the reason why they, they passed. Um, and then guard bees, uh, they essentially just guard the hive. Um, uh, if any bumblebee or wasp tries to get in, they are at the, the edge of the hive and they shoo them right out. And then towards the end of their life, they become a forager. And that's when they go and they collect the nectar and they collect the pollen and um, start working on some honey production. Uh, so that is a quick six weeks, but they do a lot <laughs> within those. So the drones, what do they do? Well, they, they don't do much. <laughs> they mate with the virgin queens and um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the queen from their hive. Um, it can be queens from neighboring hives 
for from wild hives. And this big guy right here is the drone. Um, he's bigger, he's a little bit clumsy, and they don't have, you can, they're loud, and they have, <laughs> they have a wonky flight pattern. Um, they have no stinger, they don't forage, they don't produce wax, they don't produce honey. Um, <laughs> their, their sole purpose is to mate with virgin queens. Um, and they don't feed themselves and they don't clean themselves. So once um, fall starts coming and, um, you know, they're hunkering down for winter, uh, those little drones, they get kicked out. <laughs> Um, so that's usually my first sign of fall is when I see um, these big guys getting kicked out of the hive for the winter. Um, I also, we also get asked a lot what the, um, the inside of the hive looks like. So a lot of people have seen um, honeycombs and that, that part of the, the, the hives, but in the brood chambers where the queens are, queen is laying and the bees are doing all their work, um, they're doing a lot in there. So this, this picture I took um, from one of our first, uh, first inspections of the year this year. And when we are going in, in the beginning of the year, we want to see three things happening. We want to see that they're collecting nectar, collecting pollen, and um, that the queen is a good layer. So um, this, um, shows a good sample of all of that. So this right here is the nectar, and then we have the pollen, and the pollen is their protein, um, is their protein, uh, is their protein. <laughs> um, and I love watching early spring with all the bees coming in with full pollen pants because the color of pollen that you see is just amazing. Just in this segment alone, you see like a dark gray, you see brighter yellows, darker yellows. Um, there's blacks from um, like poppy flowers. I've seen like greens from I think skunk cabbage and there's bright whites and bright reds. And there's even some blues. So there's tons of pollen colors that it's not just yellow. And then you wanna see that your queen is laying nicely. So here are examples of the eggs. So this queen is, is doing a good job and she has nice straight eggs. And then you also wanna see, diff you also will see different stages of larva. Um, so uh, once they get big and plump, like this guy in the corner, uh, the worker bees will um, cap it over. Um, and there's some capped brood in here. So, over here is a picture of the um, cat brood. So the next question we always get asked is what is a swarm? Um, people <laughs> see all those um, memes on social media saying, you know, don't kill the swarm, call a beekeeper. <laughs> so if, if, if a swarm uh, can be reached, um, yes, do call a beekeeper, but this swarm was way up top in, a, in one of our huge oak trees. This was actually last two Saturdays ago. Um, and uh, so basically what happens in a swarm is you're, the beekeeper doesn't lose the full hive. It only loses half of the hive. What happens is that there's just too many bees in in the hive and they um they decide i in my head they have like this nice little board meeting with the queen and all the bees <laughs> and they decide they decide which half of the bees are going to go with the old queen and which bees are going to stay in the hive and um be under the new queen's regime so after this is decided at that meeting um uh, the workers will then produce a new queen, um, a new queen. So around 14 to 16 days later, this new queen will hatch. And once that new queen hatches, the old queen and whoever decided to move with her, they go and find their new home. So when they're, they're, when they're in this formation, when you see them, um, you know, in the trees or uh, on some 
you know, playground material or, you know, uh, people have had them on their cars. When they're like this, this is their, their most, do they're their most docile because their, their job right now is to protect the queen, which is probably somewhere in the middle of all this. So wherever they are landing is a temporary resting spot because the other bees, um, they're scout bees that will be looking for a safe home for them. So that safe home might be a, a, a cave somewhere, a hollow in a tree, or you know, sometimes the eaves of an old barn. Sometimes people get lucky and they get them on their house and then they have to call um, a more <laughs> experienced beekeeper who do, does home removals of them. Um, so that, that is basically what a swarm is. It's just half the hive moving, moving on out. <laughs> um, so this was a funny question that I was asked once. I was asked, do you milk the bees? Um, <laughs> thankfully, we don't milk them. Um, there's way too many bees to <laughs> for that to happen. Um, the bees do most of the work. So <laughs> once the honey frames are properly cured and capped, uh, we harvest the honey. Uh, so if you see here, um, this is a bunch of the nectar that they've collected. And down here, they've already capped some of it with um, beeswax. Um, when they cap it with beeswax, that means it's ready, um, uh, it's already cured and ready to be harvest, harvested. Um, they cap it when the nectar and water ratio is um, uh, at the perfect point um, for the honey to be consumed. Um, so uh, when do we harvest honey? Um, so we only, we decided that we want to harvest the uh, honey only once a year because we're beekeepers and we're not honey takers. Um, a lot of people take a second harvest, um, but we like to have the bees have enough uh, honey to last over the winter. Um, they need about, how much, 90? 50, like 50, 50 pounds to for them to winter over. So we don't wanna take that in the late fall. Um, so we just let the bee, after our, we um, harvest the honey, we're actually harvesting probably next week. Um, we want them to have enough honey to overwinter because we don't want our bees to starve. It's, it's a sad thing to see um, in this early spring when you don't leave enough honey and you have to clean out a hive of starved bees. Um, so we only, we only harvest once a year and uh, since we did have that swarm, we'll be harvesting less uh, than we usually do. But when we do have honey available, we will let you all know <laughs> when it will be available and how you would be able to get it. Um, so we also get asked, um, where does wax come from and do we have wax available? Um, so the bees create their own wax. If you can see here, um, this lady has her wax glands all ready and set to go. Um, you can totally geek out on trying to learn the different enzymes and how <laughs> they biologically create it. Um, uh, so it's, they're fascinating little creatures. And then this over here um, is one of the honey frames that we're, we are uncapping the wax with. So this wax that is currently being uncapped, um, that will be uh, cleaned and processed. And that, that is used for candles and bombs and salves. And we typically use all our wax up, but if we do have a surplus, we do have a waiting list um, that we have um, to sell our wax to. Um, so the number one question that people ask us is how much does it cost to begin um, beekeeping? So a lot of the beekeeping stores, uh, I got these prices off of betterbee.com. Um, so a complete hive kit, soup to nuts with the um, with the frames, the boxes, the smoker, the hive, the hive tools, and 
the gloves and the veil is around $350. Um, and then the actual fees themselves um, are anywhere from like $125 to um, $200, depending on whether you get a package or a, what it's called a nucleus colony. So it's at bare minimum, it's around $500 to start. And you can always, um, you can always go overboard. <laughs> um, and you can always also try and like make your own things. Um, but it, it's around 500. Um, we um, actually set up an electric fence too for our, um, for our bees because we are in Granby and there are bears. And uh, one year we did have a bear attack. So um, if you do have bears in your vicinity, um, it's good to spend a little bit more to set up that uh, electric fence. Um, we also get asked if we can, um, if you need help with your bees. <laughs> we, like we said before, we're, we love helping um, people get started with their bees or if you have any questions about your hive or what's going on if you see that your hive has an issue or you something that you haven't seen before just definitely give us a call or ask us any questions we're always here and we're ready to geek out on bees <laughs> so um, that's it for my formal presentation um, so if any questions have come through I'm I'm glad to see you. Yeah. yeah, I can relay a few of them to you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information packed in that, like, compressed half hour, yeah. Um, let's see, Therese asked first, it was the first question to come in, um, what's the best location for your hive when choosing a spot on your property? Um, so I'm going to introduce Ron and oh. he's going to help <laughs> help field these bee questions. Oh, fielding, fielding bee questions. <laughs> oh. Hi, Ron. Hi, good evening. Well, hey there, I'm over here. You can hear me. Good evening, everybody. How are you? I hope everyone has been uh, healthy and safe these wacky three months. Um, the question, where is the best place to put a beehive? Um, I mean, Ask 10 beekeepers, you're going to get 11 answers. I mean, a very popular answer would be to have the entrance facing east so we can catch that east rising sun in the morning and start to warm up and get it really active. But I think the best place um, is anywhere you have space to put it on your property. I mean, you know, maybe it's good to have a windbreak and stuff like that. But honestly, I mean, you know, you can look at pictures of beekeepers in Brooklyn that have them up on top of buildings, have them out on their porches. Um, it, it's not really, if you can fit one in your backyard, put it there. Um, but I mean, then again, depending on what your property is set up like and everything else, you, know, you might have an electric fence and I don't know. That's not a very easy question to ask. But if you've got the room, if you've got room to put one somewhere, put it there and then uh, worry about the neighbors later. <laughs> Just give them a jar of honey. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we bribe our neighbors with honey. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> Okay, let me see, another question. Um, let's see, from Laura. How does beekeeping help to protect and grow the, the bee population? Uh, well, the issue, well, traditionally, how it used to be, say, 100, 150 years ago, old beekeepers and farmers would go out and get feral colonies from out in the woods. You know, find an old tree that had one in it, cut that tree down and drag it back to the house. And that's how they used to get their bees. Unfortunately, today, the wild, like the feral, there, there really aren't any feral bee colonies anymore. Um, like, so for instance, Fleet was talking about the hive that swarmed. Uh, you would be nice if it went out into the world and it survived out there, but more than likely, it's probably not going to make it with a high uh, uh, hive roll mite uh, load and infestation. Um, then they, they probably just won't survive. So, but how does, how does bee, I, I'll answer this a different way. I think that planting pollinator gardens and providing a, uh, a pollinator habitat is more beneficial for uh, bees of different kinds uh, that we have here in Connecticut. Um, but beekeeping does, it does help. But um, I think creating 
and not destroying their habitat, not ripping out farmland to put in townhouses and condos and creating like a pollinator habitat in your yard. Even if you just have a little patch with some flowers, every little bit helps. So maybe beekeeping so much isn't the answer, except providing and protecting their habitat is more the answer. Uh, but as a beekeeper, um, you know, you um, do all kinds of things to keep your bees healthy and alive and they survive from season to season. Um, yeah, but definitely protecting their habitat is much more beneficial than actually getting into beekeeping. But beekeeping is pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's a big priority of mine is, is making sure that there are enough things blooming throughout the entire season to encourage all right. the pollinators, right. all the pollinators. Yeah, I mean, you know, I look, I look out at my front lawn and it's not a lawn by anyone's conventional standards. No. Yeah. That's our goal too. <laughs> yeah, rip rip out your lawn and put in stuff. That's that's my recommendation. Yep, I'm with you. Who wants to mow the lawn? <laughs> we we sighed. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see. Terry has a few questions here. Which one? I'm, I'm, actually, I want to start with this one. She asks, is Better Bees Michael Jordan's company? I just thought that was sort of an interesting question. I didn't know. Uh, no, it is not. Better, Better Bee is the name of the company that's located in, uh, oh, they're out in upstate New York. I want to say they're on Greenwich, I think is how you pronounce it. But I believe Better Bee has been, been in business well before Michael Jordan's career. Yeah. Yeah, I posted a link to, to the site. Um, yeah. So let me see. Um, nooks, is that how you say it? Where do you get your nooks? Uh, nukes. So that is, that is short for nucleus. Okay. Uh, and Terry asked because she's looking for um, a, like a northern supplier. Okay. Well, um, there, there's a gentleman, uh, New England Apiaries, he's in Southwick. You can get nucleus colonies from him. There's, um, you can go through uh, Heritage Apiaries in Canton to get nucleus colonies from him. These are local people that you can drive to their place and pick them up. I mean, um, those are two very reputable places and they provide uh, an excellent product and they're both very knowledgeable um, beekeepers. Uh, the time to get nucleus colonies, though, has already passed. So you would have gotten those in, like, say, April, the beginning of May, middle, middle of May at the latest. Um, now that we're approaching the beginning of July, uh, you won't be able to get bees um, anywhere unless people are making splits and nukes from their own yards and they're selling them to people. You, you know what I mean? But to go to, like, a bigger supplier, uh, you wouldn't be able to get those now. Okay. Yeah, and um, Felitha is uh, posting some of that information um, in the chat, if anyone wants to grab it there and follow through. Um, one more question from, from Terry. Um, yeah, how many hives do you, um, do you have? Well, uh, right now we have five. We have five. We started, we went into the winter with seven, lost one very early and then lost three more. Um, pretty much just due to bad, um, bad genetics. Um, and the three hives that came out were excellent and I just made two splits and now we have five and probably next weekend I'm probably going to make at least four or five more splits. Um, and that's, and that's just called making like midsummer splits. So basically you're creating hives out of your beehives to overwinter to have a bigger, um, just a bigger bee yard to go in the winter. So if you do have winter losses, you're like, well, I mean, I have all these smaller beehives that I made and you're not buying bees. Cause I see one of the comments there from Terry is saying, yes, we got some in the past, but they were brought up from Georgia. That's correct. Uh, you can get nukes and packages that do come up from, from Georgia. Someone was talking about being able to have like a nice Northern supplier, get your bee yard up and running and then make splits from your own bee yard and be your own supplier. Um, I mean, you have to buy made queens from somebody, uh, but make splits from your own yard. Um, yeah, this was the first year that we didn't have to buy yeah. any nukes or packages. Yep. So all our bees are wintered over bees um, that we had gotten last year. I mean, they're totally different bees now, but the same. Yeah. 
same genetics. Yeah, so we we have five right now. I would I would love for you to share a little bit about the the logistical physical setup of of your you know because I, I I mean I, I I saw it briefly and it's just it looked like they were so lovingly protected. <laughs> well, I'll see if I can find a picture, but you can start. sure that. Um, so the fence setup that we have now was a few years in the making, really. Um, originally, it was just like five foot tall T posts with a welded wire and then the electric fence on the outside, and then the bear just walked over that and just <laughs> crumpled that over. So this year, I have eight foot uh, pressure treated four by fours that are at four foot spacing um, that are that were post hole dug two feet in the ground so there's six feet sticking up welded wire all the way to the top and my electric fence is outside of that now um and and that per protects the beehives now um now you know could a big papa or mama bear come and probably knock it over and get in i'm sure they could but it would be a lot harder and it's probably just not even worth their time now when they can just go to the recycling bin or the compost pile and root through that instead and it's right there um yeah but we have a pretty substantial protection now but it took me you know five beekeeping seasons to get to that to figure out what would really work here um so yeah yeah i i was dazzled when i saw it i looked at it and i would love my spouse to see it because i my first thought was when i saw it was that is the kind of fortress my my spouse would want to build around the ladies yeah. <laughs> And it's and it's important this time of the year because if you go out by our bee yard now, it smells like honey and um, and pollen and wax and you know this humidity is bringing all those scents out. Now this smells great, but if you're a bear, it smells even better. Um, yeah, and you know you will, yeah, and that will attract the bear. And we have them that come through our yard. I mean, it's right on their. Uh, I don't know, whatever their radius, not their migration route, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, their their patrol route, I guess you could say. You go right through the yard, so you have to have something like that. This is before the yeah. post. See, this is that's a that's a weenie little fence that the bear just walk right over. <clears throat> and conversely wiped out those beehives. Oh. Felitha was not standing there though, <laughs> when it when it happened. Um, on a on another note, um, Becky asks, um, "How much rye do you plant to yield a decent amount for for um, for flour?" Um, yeah, for example, how much plant uh, well, bridge of rye would uh, yield a pound of flour? I don't know yet because the um, I, I ended up planting about a six foot wide by fourteen foot long patch. Right that was pretty heavily seeded uh, and it did really well. So I, I won't know until it gets harvested how much we're gonna get out of it. I, I really don't know. So this is, so typically we've only used the rye for our art, for my art, um, but because of the whole flower shortage that <laughs> happened earlier in the year, we um, actually found my grandmother's old um, uh, flower mill a grinder and we started grinding our own um, berries that uh, uh, grain berries that we got from uh, ground up grain over in Hadley Massachusetts um, so we decided hey since I am growing the rye for my art purposes we should use the berries for the flower purposes so we will let you know after <laughs> we process that flower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would even love to hear more about that. I, our garden gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And um, you know, some of those uh, starchy carbohydrate, good keeping foods are the ones we want to plant more of to sustain us through the winter. And you know, potatoes are a, a logical choice. Mm -hmm something we grow more of every year but yeah looking at grains and we already have we have a hand grinder um yeah. so. i mean you can grow um you can grow millet you can grow amaranth and you can grow quinoa here in connecticut i think amaranth only has like a 50-day uh maturation period really 
So, I mean, you can grow all those grains right here in Connecticut. As well as like, you know, your rye and your, your hard, um, your uh, hard red winter wheat and whatnot. Yeah, Terry says too, oats grow well. I, I do love growing oats, so yeah. Yep. yeah. For food and actually I tend to grow them more for the medicine side, picking picking those those young milky oats to make fresh fresh plant medicine with and then yep. them in food for later. Yeah. So any other questions out there? Um, let me see, what do we have here? We've got like 10 more minutes. Okay, my technology is messing with me now. Um, or anything, anything else that you would like to say? Is there anything about your craft, Salifa, that you would like to? All right, <laughs> you're, you're on your beekeeping. <laughs> it's it's all it's all you. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Um, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions on any of the plethora of things that we do? <laughs> Oh, while we're waiting, um, one of the things I was looking at are, are the beautiful etched eggs. Oh, I have one here. So this egg is probably three or four years old. So hopefully I don't drop it because it'll be very stinky if I do. <laughs> so this was uh, dyed with um, onion skins. And then um, I etched the egg with um, like the tip of an X-Acto knife. And make the, the different patterns. So. Yeah, those are beautiful. Those are, those are so beautiful. That's, <clears throat> I don't know, I recently, I don't know if you recently posted something or I stumbled across a post of yours. Um, yeah. I posted some around Ostara and Easter, so. Yeah, and just, um, yeah, that, so you dye them first? Mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, with, the, with the natural dyes, um, because I'm etching the eggs, um, I will boil the eggs uh, with, um, I really like using um, beetroot too, because I get that rich um, purple, um, and I add in some blueberries to that dye too. Um, and I, it'll, uh, I like that nice, <laughs> nice color. So you'll just uh, boil the eggs in the, in the natural dye and you'll get that darker color, um, so. Yeah, so let's see, Maya's asking, tell us about your straw art. Um, so the straw art um, can come in two different forms. So like, it's the 2D, um, uh, let's see here. 2D flat where it's, um, I cut out the, I processed the straw. So when we pick the rye, it looks like, you know, rye. And then I, I, I chop off the ends and then I'm left with the straw. And then once I, ha I have all these straw pieces, I slip them down the middle. And once you split them down the middle, you wet them, and then you iron them into ribbons. And once you make ribbons, uh, I lost it. So once you make ribbons, um, you set the ribbons down, kind of like wood flooring on a piece of uh, masking tape, and it creates a sheet of basically rye paper. And then I draw and cut out designs. So they're also um, uh, ornaments that you can make too. So here's, here's one. And then here's a bigger guy that I'm working on. So, wow. Um, so yeah, they can be as small or as big and then Here's another color. And then I always put, I always like to jazz them up with some amber pieces. So that's the, the different straw art. Oh, and then you can make little birds out of the ribbons too. Precious. 
Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, we are coming down to, um, you know, the last last minutes and yeah, definitely, you know, comments. I don't know if you're watching them there too, Felitha, but yeah, definitely beautiful work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, even too, I just wanna say the, the work that you do with the bees. I just, I honor that so, so much. They are such important little I mean, pollinators, sure, but I, I often look at, at the honey that they produce. We, science has tried to reproduce it and simply cannot do it. It, it can only be done by the honeybees. And I just, I, I honor the Melissa. I, um, I do, I bow to them and I need to become a beekeeper. And, <laughs> and I have talked about that too, is not so much for, yeah, harvesting the honey, but just for, for you know, helping mm -hmm. bees. Yeah, and I'll, you know, on a rough day, I'll just go out and I'll sit in the bee yard and just listen to their buzzing and their watch their flight patterns and just get lost in meditation with the, the sound of their the hives and their buzzing. So they're definitely therapeutic for me. <laughs> yeah, good medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, um, are there any sort of final words or closing words you'd like to leave us with, Letha? Um, I actually didn't prepare any final words, <laughs> um, but I'm just loving getting back to my roots and what my, um, my father and my grandfather and my grandmother, um, we're all doing here in um on our land and just trying to get back to that and um the linden blossoms will be blossoming soon and i promise my aunt lil who's on here um that i will actually gather her some for tea this year <laughs> i forgot last year um so it's just been amazing to you know, honor my ancestors and honor the land that we're on. And I hope more people do that. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I hope so too. I hope so too. So yeah, I just um, posted some information. Um, if you missed it earlier on, some uh, links to uh, Cottage of the Three Cats website, Facebook page, and Instagram. Um, let me see, what else do I have here? Um, so yeah, be sure to visit, visit the website and um, follow on Facebook and, you know, and maybe be inspired to uh, do some beekeeping as well. Uh, let's see, I am gonna say, oh, I don't have my notes updated, so I'm gonna have to wing this. Um, but yeah, if you have enjoyed this tonight, uh, a pay what you wish contribution is definitely appreciated. Uh, let's see, join us in two weeks. And I mean, I'm just gonna double check my calendar so that I don't mess this up because I didn't update my notes, notes with the correct information. Um, but two weeks on July 9th, um, we'll be knowing neighbors with Becky and Jess, and they're going to be talking about, um, you know, sort of uh, their experience and expertise in growing and preserving and sort of uh, um, kitchen, um, kitchen magic, kitchen preservation, kitchen fun. So yeah, um, join us for that. And of course, if anyone here, um, here live or watching um, the recording afterwards if you'd like to be a co-host if you have something that you'd like to share as a good neighbor um, just get in touch with me and let me know and we'll we'll see if it's a good fit and make it happen so with that may we all discover and nurture the skills abilities and wisdom that were common not but a couple few generations ago skills that supported our families, our communities, um, and the greater world. Uh, skills that we and our neighbors have. 
skills that enable us to rely on one another rather than on the powers that be. So may we know one another. And with that, I bid you gratitude and a good evening and much peace. So have a beautiful evening, everyone. If you'd like to unmute yourself and say hi and bye, that would be fun. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Felipa. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Bye.